Welcome back. It's still Plots Politics. And let's go to the second issue. Justice delayed is justice denied. It's a popular saying as regards the disposition of justice to the masses. However, with the margins of the COVID-19 pandemic, many events and proceedings, including those of the Nigerian judiciary, were impacted and had to be put on hold. But as many societies, including those in Nigeria, are beginning to open up from the lockdown caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we wonder what is the place of the Nigerian judiciary in post-COVID-19 era? Will it return to business as usual and still operate with the issues it has been set to harbor? Or will it, be, it, will it turn a new leaf? Joining us to throw more light on this is Dr. Babatunde Ajibadi, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Kadi. And probably I should put this on record. Uh, we've had um, Dele Adeshina, who is also vying to be the president of Nigerian Bar Association. We've had uh, Olumide Alpata, who is also vying to be. And we also, we now have uh, Dr. Ajibari in the studio, who is also vying to be the president of the Nigerian Bar Association. Just to put it on record, because I understand you don't want to campaign. But we need to let the lawyers who are watching this <laughs> know this. Let's start with um, the current reality. How is judiciary faring and what has been the issue now? How are you moving out of what we call a sudden kind of new normal that we are faced with? The judiciary has um, struggled significantly, Kaede, um, through this COVID-19 pandemic. Naturally, because I don't think anybody anticipated um, this uh, pandemic. We're coming out of it very, very slowly. But the truth is we had challenges in our judiciary even before the pandemic anyway. Uh, and my hope uh, addressing the theme of, you know, the question you want us to address is that um, we will seize the opportunity of this pandemic to address some of the long-standing challenges uh, that our judiciary has, has been facing. Uh, one of those, and probably for me the, the most critical that uh, sort of reflects in everything else, being the fact that our judiciary has been heavily under-resourced uh, for so long now. Uh, and I'm hoping that um, this pandemic and the, the almost um, Coma, co, co, you know, almost comatose situation in which we found ourselves will wake us up to the fact that the judiciary deserves and needs a lot more attention than it's been getting. Okay, because uh, when we look at uh, Nigerian law, it seems to be obeyed more in breach than in observance. And it's a question of, is it a question of weakness of uh, the law of lack of institution to, I mean, to enforce these laws? Talking about um, the kind of lawlessness that we have, we even have it among the judiciary, we even have it in all strata of our nationhood. Well, you know, we need to separate issues here. The, the judiciary is part of society. So if we're talking about the general societal problems we have in Nigeria, yes, I mean, you know, the judiciary is not immune from that. Neither is the legal profession. Um, but conversely, uh, or, or in, in a way, I think the judiciary is probably one of those institutions that can, if properly galvanized, be used to address uh, those societal problems. That, that is the role that the judiciary ought to be playing. Uh, you know, law, they say, is a tool of social engineering. So if our judiciary and if the legal profession, which to me are, you know, they're supposed to work hand in hand, if they were better uh, working better, then they would be in a position to address some of those societal ills that you've, um, you've identified. Okay, let's look at um, what MBA is really all about. I, they say, oh, it's a professional group, but beyond being a professional group, it's a pressure group. And uh, some believe that going to those days, when MBA is speaking, the nation is shaking. But it appears, giving you an example of... Uh, uh, the CJN, the way it was housed, the former CJN, that uh, it appears NBA was even divided and there was no, you know, a common front to say you cannot desecrate this harm of government or you probably feel differently. 
No, I don't feel differently. And indeed, you know, you touch on what I consider to be um, the greatest challenge confronting our, our profession. And I think the judiciary and the bar, the bar and the bench, I think they're two sides, again, like I say, of the coin of the same profession. Uh, and that is the fact that we're, we're extremely divided. Uh, and I think the uh, incident involving the, the CJN um, bore that out. Um, and we're divided because there isn't a unanimity of, of purpose um, around what are our core values, what are the things that ought to hold us together. Um, we play politics with, with a lot of things, um, things that really are not political, because you know, right is right, wrong is wrong. Uh, so in my view, what we need to do to retrace our steps and to, to fix that problem uh, is to unite. It's not an easy thing. It's, uh, it's, it's a, that's my buzzword. I, I, you know, I, I talk about the need to, to build a, a united bar. I don't underestimate the difficulty, but I think we must have it as a primary objective. Because if we don't unite, the same kind of incident that occurred with, with um, the last, uh, uh, the, the immediate past CJN could reoccur. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to go back to the first question. Still trying to get some specifics now. Uh, you remember the front and back about the issue of virtual hearing. Uh, cases should not go through that route. We even had a funny experience where a particular aircraft was designated to carry judges to go handle issues, and we had a music star probably hijacked. That's to just tell us the kind of um, challenges that we are having. But before now, like you said, We've had issues of long hands. We've had issues of people not ready to go digital. Isn't a reality? Is this something that must go through constitutional amendment? Or it's time to embrace it? I don't have any doubt that um, it's time to embrace it. And I don't think even those who are contending that we require constitutional amendment are against it. Um, I think the, the, the challenge is whilst we all recognize the necessity for it, uh, and as I said, it's something that really we ought to have been doing even before uh, there was a pandemic, before it was forced on us. I, I, there's no dispute about the fact that, you know, using technology more. Uh, and I think we need to be careful because when we talk about virtual hearings, uh, people seem to think that we're, we're suggesting that, you know, the courts should be shut down and everything should go electronic. I don't think anybody's suggesting that. There's no way in the world where, absent a pandemic, you wouldn't still have in-person uh, hearings. But we're talking about, yes, we're talking about using technology more to address those things that you can use technology for. So simple applications, uh, paper, paper applications, then you don't need to bring litigants or lawyers to court. So there's the need to harness technology to address those issues. The bottlenecks we have uh, are, to me, uh, again, a, a reflection of our pension for technicalities. Uh, and because we know ourselves, we're bending over backwards to ensure that, for example, what we had with uh, the, I don't know if you're aware about the Administration of Criminal, Criminal Justice, Justice Act, yes, yeah. where a provision that everybody knows was a laudable provision that was designed to save judicial time, etc was struck down in the Supreme Court. Uh, and, you know, you, if you talk to six lawyers, there are three who will tell you that, yeah, the Supreme Court was right. There are three who will tell you the Supreme Court was wrong. So now that we're talking about virtual hearing, with that recent experience, I think there's a lot more caution about, re yes, we all know that virtual hearings are a good thing if we can, you know, if we can put the resources in place, put the technology in place. But then we need to make sure that we do it in such a way that we don't have an Administration of Criminal Justice uh, Act scenario That's where true. you've done virtual hearings, you've got convictions, and then six, seven years down the line, you know, you get a decision that says, well, all that was unconstitutional and you have to go and start all over again. So, so whilst I'm sympathetic to, to the arguments that clearly, you know, the Constitution is a living document, it should be interpreted in a manner that gives effect to the presumed intent, et cetera, et cetera, with that recent ACJA uh, experience, yeah. I, I, I cannot help but share the, the caution of those who say, well, look, yes, it's a great thing, but 
maybe we should dot the I's and cross the T's. Now, whether that needs to be by way of constitutional amendment is not, that wouldn't be my preferred option. I think my preferred option is to take the matter to the Supreme Court as quickly as possible. Once there's a pronouncement on it by the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land, then that's the end of the matter. Become a president. Yes. Okay, let, let's look at things that affect your members directly, you know, talking about you being the president. Uh, I'm aware, at least from some friends who are lawyers, I'm not a lawyer, talking about this huge dichotomy between the young lawyers and the senior lawyers, where you belong anyway, that um, they seem to be totally big gulf between those people. How do you intend to address that? As, because they are your members too. Definitely. You, you know, I, I say this, um, I, I think we need to recalibrate that classification. Um, clearly, lawyers that are just coming into the profession, who I would, I like to describe them, we all call them new wigs, they, they deserve extra special protection because, you know, they're just finding their feet. Some of them haven't even found their feet. They're just coming, they don't know uh, that much. All they know up to that point is theory. I think they need their hands to be held considerably. But then the, the young lawyer in um, the NBA parlance is anybody who is seven years uh, or less at the bar. And to be honest, I know lawyers who are below seven years who are doing very, very well. And I know lawyers who are 15, 20, 25 years at the bar who are really struggling. So mm. that, that dichotomy that, you know, we must, it's something that I, I struggle with. I, I think that we must look at the welfare of the legal professional generally, generally in, a, in, a, in a lot more uh, holistic fashion. And my view is that one of the greatest challenges confronting us in the profession today is that too many lawyers are struggling, not just young lawyers, even senior lawyers. And how do you intend to get that addressed? Well, you know, you did say that we're not allowed to, to campaign. To campaign? Yes. But, okay, uh, how, but, should but, but anyway, <laughs> how should that be addressed? How should that be addressed? I have, I have um, some ideas about how that should be addressed. Um, I think one of the, the challenges from a welfare perspective is, and of course, again, I need to, I need to you know, you need to classify the legal professional because the legal professional is not just the one in private practice. But from the point of view of the private practitioner, uh, I, I think there's a lot that needs to be done to shore up, to strengthen the profession. We're, we're struggling because we're producing 7,000 roughly lawyers every year. Um, the, the, the pot is not getting larger. So I think we need to make a conscious effort to enlarge the pot. Mm -hmm. I think we may need to make a conscious effort to assist lawyers to be a bit more open-minded about what they can do. Uh, I think the reason why we're struggling is because so many of us are all uh, trying to do the same, same thing. Same. But then there's so many things that lawyers can do, and that's one of the things that I think the NBA ought to, ought to be championing. So looking at yes. Uh, I, so so uh, I never knew time has gone. <laughs> uh, but probably in the next one or two minutes, we should be rounding off this conversation. But something very important that we often say is that when we talk about the three hams of government and when you talk about the activities of the judiciary, it seems to, in our mind, seems to be restricted to the privileged few in terms of is judiciary not again the last hope of the masses? When people are being faced with some kind of injustice, the legal fee chases them away, talking about the impression we have there. So how can this, you know, how can their hope be regained in terms of the practicality now that, oh, I can approach a lawyer and I can get justice probably at a mega fee? I think that is a that is clearly a challenge, uh, uh, Kayode, because you know we need to strike a balance. So I was talking about the welfare of the legal professional. Um, I clearly would not be true to my profession if I were to say that I'm happy to create a situation where lawyers provide legal services for a meager fee. You know, lawyers are entitled to make a living. Hear me out. But I do think that society, because of that role that the law plays, uh, we must have a way of protecting those 
who can otherwise not afford uh, legal services. And that's why you have things like legal aid. You know, and that's why we need to work to make sure that those things are more efficient, so that those who can't afford to, to pay for to pay the standard or regular fee for legal services are not left without uh, protection. But but I don't think that lawyers should work for meager fees as a rule. Hmm. Yeah. Very very blunt about that. Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thank you so much for your time, and uh, thank you, uh, Doctor Baba Tunde Ajibade, SAN. Because if I don't put that in here, I might get into trouble. <laughs> and thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, I'll be giving you my take. Please don't go anywhere. Welcome. And this is my take. The situation in the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC, is one of the he said, she said. Who is saying the truth and who is lying as regarding the removal of Joy Mumie? I hope I got that name. I asked why was she given the position in the first place if she had no NYC discharge certificate? Why wasn't this checked before? And also, can insubordination be properly defined for Nigerians to fully understand the gravity of the former MD? Well, as the saga progresses, hopefully, we'll get the answers we want. But I must say that it is truly appalling that such huge amounts are being toyed with by our leaders while many structures in the country are wasting away, especially in an administration that has been running on an anti-corruption agenda. Our leaders need to do better. The Nigerian judiciary this time around is regarded as the hope of the common man. But what we see today is a reverse of the case. And this is not the only issue this arm of government faces. Insufficient funds as lack of manpower development, inadequate facilities and others also plague this arm of government. However, the most important hurdle the judiciary faces is subjection to the executive arm of government. A proper democracy is one where there is adequate separation of powers. No one arm must have absolute power. So to the Nigerian judiciary, I ask that you cast off the shackles the executive has put on you and fight for your freedom and give Nigerians what they truly deserve, which is justice. And that's my take for tonight. Thank you for staying with us. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. Plus, politics returns tomorrow at the same time. Until then, have a great evening. <laughs>